I'll do my formal bit. So, so welcome to our alert seminar on the implications of the Queen versus Baden Clay High Court of Australia for environmental prosecutions. And it is really great to see so many people here interested to be part of this discussion. So uh, thank you for coming along today. My name is Jenny Camilleri. I am from the Queensland Department of Environment and Heritage Protection, and I'll be your host for today's seminar. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and elders of the land on which we, are, we meet today and gather and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Now to cover off uh, on a bit of housekeeping matters, just to start, um, as we have a few people here from uh, different departments and locations today, if in the event there's emergency, just please follow the directions of the building and departmental staff and we'll guide you through that process. And if you need the amenities, they're located behind the lifts um, um, on this floor. And as I've said, we've made about some light refreshments. If you haven't had the opportunity to get one now, as we've been setting up, you're more than welcome to, if you have the time to stay later on, you can have one after the presentation. And you will also see uh, there's a feedback form on your seat. We'd really appreciate you um, if you could take the time to complete this uh, before you leave. It's an opportunity to get your feedback on today and also for the future events for the alert. So, I'll get out of here. <laughs> Sorry. I think my voice is loud enough anyway, so. Um, and uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Chris McGrath to talk with us today on this very important topic. Um, and Dr. McGrath will be discussing the implications for environmental prosecutions, in particular the principle of onus of proof, and what this means when there is no direct evidence, only circumstantial evidence, which is relied upon to establish the guilt of an offender. Now I'd like to introduce um, Dr. McGrath, just a bit of information on him. He uh, joined the University of Queensland in 2010 and is the Senior Lecturer for Environmental Regulation at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels. Uh, after he graduated with, the, with a Bachelor of Science, a Bachelor of Laws Honours in 1998, he worked as an environmental officer for the former Queensland Environmental Protection Agency. And he's also completed his, in, his doctorate on how to evaluate the effectiveness of an environmental legal system in 2007. And prior to joining the University of Queensland, he practised uh, in Brisbane as a barrister, specialising in environmental regulation and has published extensively in this area in Queensland. And I know when I had a, a conversation with uh, Dr McGray yesterday, he's actually very passionate about this alert network and sees it as a valuable uh, uh, network for sharing information, ideas, providing training, and actually initiated this opportunity to talk with us today. So uh, if you could please join me in welcoming Dr McGrath here today. Thanks, Jenny. Hey, it's uh, great to be here to talk with you. Um, I, as Jen said, I'm really um, supportive of Alert. I think it's a really important network. And um, I want to um, note that uh, we've got about 50 people here. Uh, about half of us come from EHP, so um, major piece of legislation, obviously, Environmental Protection Act, but a range of other acts that the department administers. We've also got a chunk of staff from Brisbane City Council, as well as uh, NRM and then uh, a few uh, from other uh, departments. So we've got a range of different regulators here uh, and you administer a range of different acts. I'm going to focus on vegetation management offences um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, acknowledging that not everyone regulates vegetation management, but the actual original idea for the seminar came from talking with Susanna Payne, who's here uh, in the audience from uh, in-house legal with NRM and a range of other departments. And we were chatting about um, compliance activities for veg management a, a couple of months ago. And I just said on the phone, well, you, you know, the Baden Clay decision has big implications for veg management, doesn't it? Um, and anyway, it started the ball rolling. I chatted with Omar here at EHP and we thought it'd make a good alert seminar. Um, we've, I'd acknowledge that not everyone here is a lawyer, so I really want to pitch um, the presentation both for compliance staff. Uh, as well as lawyers working in you know, whatever legal capacity you are. Um, also, the seminar is being recorded so um, that regional staff um, can hear it, as well as um, staff in other jurisdictions. So I'm not going to try. I'm going to try and avoid being too Queensland-centric um, for for that reason. So the points I want to cover are 
Um, I'm going to start with take-home points and I've given you a handout with three take-home points um, from this seminar. And I can boil down the take-home points actually to three words, post-offence conduct, because that's the really significant thing that comes out of the, the Baden-Clay decision and something that's really useful to be aware of for environmental prosecutions, um, whatever sphere you're working in, but I'm going to, as I say, focus on veg management. I'll give you a summary then of the Baden-Clay decision, um, implications for uh, decision, implications of the decision for environmental prosecution, so building upon the take-home points a bit. Uh, and then I want to give you a case study of um, taking a natural resource in a national park, just to work through the elements of an environmental offence and, and um, build up um, or really cross-pollinate the ideas from Baden Clay's obviously a murder prosecution, so criminal code, you might think how is that relevant to environmental prosecutions, I want to cross-pollinate into environmental prosecution context and so we'll look at clearing in a national park um, and then I also want to cover policy implications in the context of the recent failure to reverse the onus of proof, you might remember that political controversy a couple of months ago where the, gov the, cur the current government failed to get up a bill. Um, one of the provisions in it that was particularly controversial was reversing, inserting or reinserting a, a section 67A into the Veg Management Act which reversed the onus of proof if clearing occurs on someone's land then effectively it's taken un unless proved otherwise that the clearing was carried out by the occupier of the land at the time. So um, Baden Clay has um, a real role to play in that sort of context. So those are things I want to cover. Um, and there's a, a whole host of good material coming out about the Baden Clay decision. There's a really good seminar um, on the 20th of this month um, by the Bar at the Bar Association, Bar Association of Queensland. Um, Soroya Ryan QC gave a really interesting discussion of the what happened in the Court of Appeal um, and then on the special leave application and appeal to the High Court. And I don't want to cover all of the technical detail and differences of what happened. I really want to um, uh, sort of push through the detail and, and focus on a few key aspects that are relevant to environmental prosecutions. But that sort of seminar is, you know, um, there's a recording available on the Bar Association um, website for any lawyers, for instance, that are interested or... Um, and I then come to take home points, I'm going to start with them. Um, so I've given you a handout, so if you just take that out, the first page has got the three take home points. The first one that I really want to emphasise, and you might want to highlight or just <coughs> scribble on the words post-defence conduct. So the decision has important implications for environmental prosecutions, particularly where circumstantial evidence um, such as post-defence conduct is relied upon to establish the identity of the offender. Um, secondly, um, it's short, clear and a unanimous statement by the current High Court uh, and, and that's really helpful for explaining to magistrates um, the principles for use of circumstantial evidence in summary prosecution. So obviously the baden Clay decision involved a prosecution on an indictment in the Supreme Court of Queensland going all the way to the High Court. You get a really high calibre of judge in the, the Supreme Court particularly. Um, when you go down to um, magistrate's court, so lots of, you know, most of our environmental offences you can't prosecute on indictment or we choose not to. So you're constantly in the magistrate's court and you know if you work in the magistrate's court that magistrates are busy, they're um, often, you know, really smart and they, they you know, can get to work on an issue, but complex law is not isn't is often a barrier. Um, so you need some clear, simple principles. Um, and that's particularly in the context where you, you might have the defence strategy, um, which um, Susanna and I have encountered with mangrove prosecutions, um, of the defence basically putting the crown to proof and then doing everything that they can to confuse the magistrate um, with the, you know, the complex defences or those sorts of issues. So if the defence strategy is confused, it makes the prosecution case harder and the magistrate can just get sucked into that confusion and you get to lose them. And because the Crown bears the onus of establishing the offence beyond reasonable doubt, if the magistrate's confused and they've got a reasonable doubt, you lose. So it's important in that context. 
Um, and the final take home point um, that I'd make is environmental officers, um, investigators and lawyers should be aware of the implications um, of this decision, particularly for offences that say you're using satellite imagery or something where you don't have direct evidence of the um, offender's identity. So classic veg clearing offence comes to the attention of the department by a satellite sweep. You identify that clearing's been done. You might go out there, but who did it is long gone. And if the landholder just takes the course of, I'm not gonna talk to you, how do you establish who did the clearing? So this decision is useful in that context. Um, and even to, you know, you might have a witness, but the defence might attack the credibility of that witness. So this, the circumstantial evidence that you can bring in through bait and clay can be useful to um, corroborate your direct evidence. So I just want to um, make a point of clarification too. Um, And that's just to explain what circumstantial evidence is. I'm going to use that term a lot. So circumstantial evidence is evidence of a, a basic fact or facts from which the jury or the magistrate in a summary offence is asked to infer further facts um, from. And it's traditionally contrasted with direct or testimonial evidence, um, which is the evidence of a person who witnessed the primary event sought to be proved. So to give you an example, if someone burst through that door right now, ran in with a gun and shot me repeatedly, and I fall to the ground, blood's pouring out, and I die, you can all give um, evidence, direct evidence, about the identity of the offender. You say, yep, you can identify them, you can tell what occurred. Um, however, if we're all in this room and we heard bang, bang, bang outside, so we didn't actually see the offence, and um, we race out and someone's running off, <coughs> Um, that's a, a, a f you can, we can give evidence to say we saw this person running off with a gun in their hand, which is circumstantial evidence that goes to establish that you know they were the offender who say shot the person outside the door. So um, circumstantial evidence and um, is you know ubiquitous and it's often um, uh, quite complex to build up. You build up an overall picture. So. Um, to use a metaphor, um, circumstantial evidence may be woven together like strands of a cable, is the common metaphor that's used, um, rather than links in a chain to infer an ultimate fact. So you look at the whole um, circumstances around the offence and you take that all together, so weaving it together to establish your ultimate guilt of the offender. Lies and post-offence conduct are a species of circumstantial evidence an inference of guilt may be drawn from the series of interconnected things, um, the circumstances, including the post-defence conduct. And I'm going to build upon that um, with a couple of examples from Baden-Clay and a few other cases. So let's look at the Baden-Clay decision. Um, so I've given you a few extracts from your handout, but I'll just take you through some basics about it. So um, on, at 7.30 a.m. on Friday the 20th of April, 2012, Jared Baden Clay reported his wife and mother of three children, Alison, missing from um, their house in Brooklyn, <coughs> west of Brisbane. And it was, from that point on, it was blanket news coverage um, in the series of sort of steps that ha have led up to the um, High Court decision. So he um, said to police that um, she'd walked from the house at about 10 pm um, the night before and hadn't returned home. Um, and Police were um, out searching for her and there was a big community effort to try and locate her. But it wasn't until 10 days later that her um, badly decomposed body was found about 13 kilometres away from the family house beneath a bridge. Um, and because she was, her body was so badly decomposed, the cause of death couldn't be precisely determined. But there were a few things that were, were, were useful um, from the post-mortem in terms of <coughs> discounting things like there, was no, there were no injuries to her head, so it didn't look like she'd either suicided off the bridge and her head had been crushed or you know, fallen by accident. Um, there were things like that that were useful, but cause of death couldn't be determined. Um, Baden-Clay had 
um, some cut marks on his face that looked, and evidence told him he was led to trial, that they were caused by um, uh, scratches. So um, that was an issue. Um, and um, a range of things, I'll come back to um, Baden play the, the circumstances, but a range of things built up to him being charged and then going to trial. Before I get there though, can I just give you two other cases that are relevant to understand how you get to the High Court's decision in baden Plain. The first is um, a famous decision um, called Plomp and the Queen from 1963. Um, so Plomp um, went for a swim with his wife um, uh, at Southport um, in the Gold Coast um, just on dusk in 1961 and only he came back in. Um, the evidence was that it was a pretty calm day. Um, she was a strong swimmer. Um, the, the, the sort of conditions that shouldn't have um, caused her to drown. But he gave evidence that it was a strong undertow, he couldn't get to her, and that was what caused her to drown. No one witnessed um, the drowning other than him. Um, so it ultimately went all the way to the High Court and the things that were taken into account at trial and in the High Court were a couple of key bits of circumstantial evidence. Prior to his wife's drowning, the accused had started an affair with another woman whom he told, this is, he told the other woman that his wife was dead uh, and a few days before his wife's, wife's death, he proposed marriage to this woman and he introduced one of his children to as their new mummy. So law students remember, often remember the new mummy um, quote um, from this case. And following the drowning, the accused lied about his affair and his relationship with the other woman and sought to get her to lie about it to police. He attempted to marry her and, <coughs> moved, and moved in with her. So the affair occurring before the offence is circumstantial evidence about that it wasn't just a happy marriage, that there were things going on and that he had a reason or a motive why he might want a death. And the, what occurred afterwards is post-offence conduct that also builds the picture or a strand that comes together. So the High Court in Plomp, 1963, didn't use the term post-offence conduct, but they clearly take it into account. And then, um, Dixon, Chief Justice Dixon um, famously said in that case, in the present case it appears to me that if the jury weighed all the circumstances they might reasonably conclude that it, was, it would put an incredible strain on human experience if Plomp's evidence, evident desire to get rid of his wife at that particular juncture, presaged as it was by his talk and actions, were fulfilled by her completely fortuitous death although a good swimmer and in circumstances which ought not to involve any danger to her. So um, that was a famous case about circumstantial evidence and it basically is um, the, the principle that is, comes from it in other cases is um, if you've got a purely circumstantial case, you can only convict if there is no other reasonable hypothesis of what occurred other than the guilt of the accused. So there's got to be can't be just like, you can't just think, oh, well, Martians might have come down and, and you know, drowned her. It can't be com something that's completely ludicrous. But if there is a reasonable hypothesis, um, and in, in, in the circumstances of that case, the High Court held that it, there was no reasonable hypothesis or the jury was entitled to conclude that he was guilty of her murder. Okay, another famous case is Weisensteiner in 1993, another Queensland case. Um, in this case, two people who were building a boat to um, sorry, two people were building a boat to sail around the Pacific, and they were joined by the accused, who agreed to work for no wages if um, they took him on their cruise. Um, the three departed Cairns on the 27th of November 1989 and were seen a short distance north of Cairns. Only the accused was ever seen again, and there was ample evidence, such as lack of communication with their families lack of use of bank accounts and etc. that the two others were deceased. Um, the boat returned to Cairns in December 1989 with only the accused on board. No one saw obviously what occurred. Um, the accused departed Cairns in January 1990 and spent eight months sailing around the Pacific during which he gave inconsistent stories about who was the owner of the vessel and the whereabouts of the deceased 
before he was de detained in the Marshall Islands due to an Interpol warrant um, issued regarding the vessel and the deceased. He attempted to escape custody but was recaptured. Um, he didn't give evidence at the trial for murder and the case was, went to the High Court um, about directions to the jury that the jury might more readily um, uh, conclude that he caused their death because of his silence, um, the f his failure to rebut the case that the Crown had, had um, presented. So that was another famous um, case. So then we get to the facts in Baden Clay. So in this, a few key points. The accused gave evidence that he left, so he actually gave evidence in, in the trial. Um, he gave evidence that he left his wife alone watching TV on the night she died, and he had nothing to do with his death. So it wasn't me, I wasn't involved at all. Um, he said the cuts on his face occurred while he was shaving. Um, expert evidence at trial suggested deep cuts were consistent with scratch marks, um, while later cuts were consistent with shaving. So it appeared, um, and the jury was entitled to um, uh, conclude that he had tried to conceal that the Allison had caused scratch marks while presumably he was strangling her. Um, and then he'd later tried to conceal the, the scratch marks by basically cutting the shelf deliberately shaving. Um, the cause of death was unable to be determined. Um, and in this case, he'd been having an affair with another woman since 2008, so four years. Um, and he told that woman that he'd be out of his marriage by the 1st of July. Um, he confirmed that promise in writing um, less than three weeks before his wife's disappearance. After his wife's death, the accused made elaborate attempts to conceal her death um, and lied to police and others about her being simply missing. And after his wife disappeared, the accused lied to police about his ongoing affair and told the woman that he was having an affair with um, that they um, need not um, communicate and that she should lay low. So these are all post the offence. Um, but they're all circumstances which were before the jury and the High Court ultimately decided the jury was entitled to consider those things in concluding, even though no one other than Baden Clay knew what actually occurred um, um, when he murdered her or, or how she came to die, because when it went to the High Court the issue was not whether he killed her but whether he intended to kill her and the difference was if he intended to kill her it was murder and if he just pushed her in a fight but didn't intend to kill her and she died, then he would be guilty of manslaughter. So that was the issue. And the High Court held, our Court of Appeal had held, the jury couldn't have been satisfied of intent. And that went to the High Court, and the High Court said, well, no, that's wrong. Look at all of these things, all of this circumstantial evidence, <coughs> including the post defence conduct. So, and that's where I come to the handout. So if you take the handout and go to page one, there's a great short summary of the main principles for using circumstantial evidence to establish guilt at paragraphs 46 and 47. So two paragraphs summarising all the, all the key law made by all seven judges of the current High Court. So brilliant, you know, simple, put it there, you know, all the principles in one place. Um, and then if you go over the page, you don't need to deal with, with those of summarising, there's basically got to be no other reasonable hypothesis than the guilt of the accused. Um, if, but if you go over, particularly paragraphs 72 and 77, um, under the heading post-defence concealment and lies, and this is the High Court discussing the Queensland Court of Appeals um, treatment of the post-defence conduct, uh, and the court of, our Court of Appeal had said, well, that the only post-defence conduct that, that the jury could have relied upon were the scratch marks. And the High Court said, well, no, that's wrong. Um, he the jury was entitled to consider the false denials to police about the ongoing affair. So this is after the offence uh, and, and telling his, um, what's the right word, the person he was having an affair with, um, that she should lie low. So those things were post-offence conduct the jury was entitled to consider. Um, and also the links that he went to to conceal his wife's body. Um, and um, you see in 76, that putting that all together, as a matter of human experience, it was um, basically likely that he um, wouldn't have done those things unless he, he was um, intentionally had killed his wife. So um, Baden Clay um, now is obviously staying in prison for a very long time, um, convicted of murder, 
um, there was obviously a lot of you know, public um, relief um, <coughs> over that, just that you know, it was a community feeling that justice had been done. I, I certainly felt when the Court of Appeal decision came out, I just thought, how is that possible? You know, in the context of knowing principles from PLOMP, and you, you, you were hearing all these things in the press about what was going on, you just thought, gosh, it just seemed incredible that he wasn't, he didn't do it and he didn't intend to murder it. So the High Courts really reinstated what um, the judgment really should have been. And, um, ex and importantly for our purposes, where they treat post-defence conduct, they're really um, giving a new label um, to a, a sort of subspecies of circumstantial evidence, and that's really useful. <coughs> So, um, I just summarise the implications, and this feeds into the three key points. So, the decision uh, has important implications for environment and prosecutions where circumstantial evidence such as post defence conduct is relied upon. That's my first point. Can I just flesh that out? The labelling of post defence conduct by the High Court um, puts places it squarely in the gaze of law enforcement officers and other courts in a way that it hasn't really been in the, been in the past. Although it's been considered in, in detail, particularly the Victorian um, Court of Appeal in 2006 decision, which the High Court refers to in, in the extracts I've given you, the um, uh, Siantar decision, um, considered post-defence conduct. But this is the first time the High Court's used the terminology. Um, and that's useful. Um, it's part... Post-defence conduct, when you look at Plomp, you look at Weisensteiner, it was there and being used by the courts previously. They just didn't call it this. So it's effectively just a new label for this part of circumstantial evidence. So in that context, it's not a huge change from what there was before, but um, it adds emphasis to it. Um, it's now a recognised subspecies of, of circumstantial evidence, and I think that's really useful, particularly as we go on to the, the second... Um, uh, take home point. When you're going before magistrates, um, you know, having a unanimous High Court judgment that talks about post defence <coughs> conduct, you can then adopt that language, particularly if you're relying upon things like, um, you know, satellite imagery, you can't identify the, who <coughs> did the offence. Um, that's really useful when you say you, you, you ultimately charged a land ho landholder. Okay, so a la large amount of clearing has occurred on <coughs> top of land. Landholder refuses to um, talk to you, talk to the, you know, the enforcement staff, but everything's pointing towards, you know, big area of clearing doesn't just happen, um, you know. It requires a, you know, heavy machinery, it's expensive, takes time. Um, all of those things, it's highly unlikely that, um, A, it wouldn't occur without the landholder's um, consent or, and payment, um, but also, it's also really unlikely that some sort of unknown third party who the landholder can't identify would have done it by accident to someone else's land. You know, you don't go and spend, you know, no one goes and spends $50,000 on their neighbour's house to have it, you know, some work done to it, you know, when your house, you know, you do it to your house. So if you think about the principles of plomp and circumstantial evidence, it's sort of, um, it's just outside normal human experience that these, you know, a big area of clearing would occur on someone's land without them being involved. And um, the fact that, um, particularly with landholders, if you can look at things like um, the use that they're making of land, so say the clearing is, took place a year ago, and by the time enforcement staff get out there, um, the landholder is running cattle on the land that's been cleared, has fenced it, um, sown it for pasture seed, that sort of stuff, they're actively using the land. All of that is post-defence conduct. But it's all really good circumstantial evidence of the fact that the landholder was the one that did the clearing. Do you agree? So, um, th this decision is really useful, I think, for, as I say, um, most of our environmental offences are prosecuted summarily in magistrate's court. You've got a good, short, um, well-written judgment that refers to this, brings it out, draws it out from the sort of um, the complexity of um, a lot of other cases. So, um, you guys, whether you're a compliance staff um, or 
um, a lawyer or a legal policy staff, it's a really useful judgment to be aware of. Say you're a compliance officer, being aware that post-defence conduct, things like, you know, say, who's, who does veg? Who's a compliance officer here? Okay, so you go out to a property, the offence has occurred in the past, the landholder is refusing to talk to you, but looking at what they're doing now, that's all post-defence conduct. And so, you know, recording what they're doing now, getting, gathering that evidence, and then, you know, putting it up the line to the, you know, the um, legal unit, the people that are going to review whether there's sufficient evidence for prosecution. You guys do the initial sift of what evidence sort of gets brought, brought up um, for a decision <coughs> to be made on whether to prosecute. So you guys need to be aware of it, and then, the, you know, the lawyers um, review that in the context of um, this decision, and to make a decision ultimately on whether there is, um, you know, uh, whether applying prosecution, you know, discretion, all the relevant policy, whether there is um, uh, a case that, um, you know, prosecution should be commenced. I just want to talk about a case study then of um, um, taking a natural resource in a national park, um, just to link it across. I've already given you the link with this landholder example. But if we talk about um, um, a case, Crown and Boyle, um, it was a... Um, Adam and Downs land you guys hear this? ...guilty to clearing about 13 hectares of World Heritage listed National Park. The Grazier has offered to hand over some of his own land to escape a jail term. In 2001, Vincent Boyle bulldozed 14,000 trees in Main Range National Park near Warwick to connect two parcels of his land for cattle grazing. Two years later, bushwalkers discovered the clearing roughly the size of 26 football fields. The farmer had erected barbed wire fences and even sown the land with pasture seed. The impacts relate to loss of habitat for rare and threatened species, which made the area so important. The area was declared a national park in 1994. It was World Heritage listed the following year. Brisbane's district court heard six threatened or endangered species have been severely impacted. These rainforests are significant on a world scale. They are comparable to the reefs in the Great Barrier Reef, to the sand dunes on Fraser Island. At the time, the 76-year-old pleaded ignorance, but the court heard he knew he was clearing outside his boundary lines and hadn't <coughs> sought any permits. Yes, I did. It's estimated reforestation will take six years and cost more than $400,000. The offence carries a maximum penalty of two years jail, but in a deal struck outside the courtroom, Boyle could avoid a custodial sentence. Pending the court's approval, the deal would see Boyle hand over 430 hectares of his land to extend the Main Range National Park. The sentencing judge reserved his decision until next week. Angela Cox, seven years. Okay, anyone involved in um, the Boyle, the series of Boyle cases, because that was his being a um, recidivist offender and been um, <coughs> had a number of offences for land clearing of his property since then. Has anyone been involved in the prosecutions of Boyle? Okay. So um, his property, a couple of hours um, south of Brisbane, um, just over the um, main range. And if you, if you think of zooming in on Google Earth, um, you basically see, as you moved in closer to his property, a whole patchwork, um, pretty well um, vegetated areas that are within protected areas, and then everything else around it being cleared, which is always, I always find it really sad to go walking on Mount Lindsay out there because you look at, you know, you can tell the protected areas, they're the areas with trees, and you look at everywhere else, it's just eroding gullies, and it's horrible. Anyway, um, Main Range National Park sits just north of a property that he's got, and his properties sort of wrap around it. And there were two um, paddocks that he had um, that had already been cleared in the 90s. And what he did, um, but they were, they were separated, and what he did was clear across the National Park to join the two paddocks. And he cleared 13 hectares within Main Range National Park. Bushwalkers came across it, so after the clearing. Um, um, bushwalkers came across it and um, was reported and um, he was ultimately prosecuted. Um, I just used Section 62 of the Nature Conservation Act, which was a relevant offence, as an example of, of where you get sort of post-offence conduct coming in. So in, you heard in that presentation that things like he'd fenced it 
um, you wouldn't be able to see it, but in the, in the images there were cattle grazing on it, he'd sown the land for pasture seed. All of that is post-offence conduct. In that case, though, he ultimately accepted his guilt and pleaded guilty. But if, the case, if you change the facts slightly so he didn't plead guilty and just put you to proof, how could you build up um, or how could you use his post-offence conduct? So Section 62 of the Nature Conservation Act um, says a person, I, I cut out the, other, the bits that are irrelevant, a person um, must not take, use um, a natural resource of a protected area other than under a permit. Let's just summarise it as that. So um, take includes um, for a plant, destroy, dig up, fell, um, and use um, basically means um, buy, sell, give away, possess, or gain any benefit from the resource or wildlife. So um, he's charged with a Section 62 offence. The facts, if we think about it, are there's a large area cleared in a national park in a remote area. We know that, so we can establish that. It's discovered by bushwalkers after the clearing occurred, so we don't have any evidence yet of who did it. Um, the cleared area joined and substantially expanded two existing cleared paddocks of a neighbouring farmer and due to the location no other person benefited from the clearing. So what's that if we're thinking about it? Is it um, direct evidence of him having done it or is it it's circumstantial evidence? So neighbouring property, two paddocks, this clearing joins two paddocks. That's good circumstantial evidence that the person that is benefiting from the clearing is probably the one who did it. Um, the neighbouring farmer was found to be actively farming the area when the offence was investigated. So he directed barbed wire fences, he'd sown the cleared area with pasture seed and allowed his cattle to graze in the cleared area. All of that is circumstantial evidence, but it's post-offence conduct. So if you took it that he didn't plead guilty, just claimed a right to silence, put the crown to proof, could you prove that he was the person that did the clearing or it was undertaken on, you know, he procured it, someone else did it, but he procured it? Well, you'd have a pretty damn strong circumstantial case um, built around those facts. If there's no one else that benefits from it, he's now using it, he'd be guilty of a Section 62 offence simply from the use. But the big thing that you'd want to get him with is the um, take the actual destruction of the trees because that's where the, the biggest, you know, if his case was, I just found it this way, someone else cleared it, yeah, I'm, I'll cop to using it, but I'm not going to accept that I didn't do the clearing. If that was his case, then you'd expect a substantially lesser penalty for him and you really wouldn't be doing justice because you as a regulator, you really want to get the right offence. Um, so the circumstances of it, including the commercial benefit, the relationship of the land, as well as what he's doing with the land can be used. And that's where I, as I say, um, that's sort of cross-pollinating the bait and clay principles into an environmental context. Can I talk um, finally about policy implications? So um, the Veg Management Bill that was defeated um, a couple of months ago had proposed to insert a, set, a new reinsert section 67A which provided that the clearing of vegetation on land in contravention of a vegetation clearing provision is taken to have been done by an occupier of the land in the absence of evidence to the contrary. So reversal of the onus of proof. And basically the Crown then doesn't have to prove that the occupier did it because the law presumes that they did. And that was very controversial and the bill was defeated so we don't have it. The explanatory notes go into why that provision is justified, including that um, unlawful clearing often occurs in remote areas, um, meaning in many cases there's a lack of evidence available to the government through direct witnesses, copies of contracts, to establish who undertook the clearing. Um, due to the expense of clearing, it's highly unlikely that an unknown third party would undertake clearing on someone else's property without the occupi occupier's invitation and consent. Um, and also that if someone else has done it, then the <coughs> landholder is likely to be in a position where they'll know about it and they can give evidence to rebut the presu presumption. So taking all those things, it's fair to basically impose liability on, it, on the occupier. Can I say I fully agree with Section 67A. I think it's a sound provision, that um, a sound policy provision, and it should be part of the law, but it's not. So what I'm saying, um, 
and the point I was making to Susanna a couple of months ago was um, bait and play is actually really useful. You know, we don't have Section 67A, but if you look at bait and play and you look at like a circumstantial case, all of those things that are in the explanatory notes, are blood, they're all circumstantial. And they're the exact reasons why you should be, you know, you, you, if you do your homework, um, if someone's got a big area of clearing on their land, you're going to be, the defence is really going to be stretching it to get, you know, a judge to accept that it wasn't the landholder who did it. When you, if you, if you use the um, bait and clay principles um, and think of, say, the words of um, Dixon in Plomp, I just reword it a little bit, weighing all of the circumstances, it would put an incredible strain on human experience given the commercial context and later use of the land if the clearing was completely fortuitous occurrence done by some unidentified third party without the knowledge and consent of the landholder and the direction and payment of the land, of, by the landholder. So um, particularly if they're using the land, you know, you've got a, you've got a really strong circumstantial case. <laughs> Having said that, circumstantial case, you'd always grab direct evidence if you can get it. You're going to be searching for that. You know, you're going to be looking for contractors. You might go and look at the financial records of the landholder, get a warrant to, you know, to um, search them, you know, look for payments to, you know, a land clearer. You know, if you've got a commercial company that at the time the offence occurred, you know, $50,000 was paid to, a, you know, operators of bulldozers. You go and talk with those bulldozer operators. You try and... You know, you bring in every bit of evidence that you can and try and get a, a, a witness if you can get it because circumstantial cases are, are always going to be hard, harder than if you've got a you know, credible witness of, of the offence occurring. Um, but it's, what I really want to emphasise is that it's there and bait and play helps. So um, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Does anyone have any questions for me? Only if they're not difficult. <laughs> well, I hope they're not difficult. Um, if you've got clearing on land and the landholder claims that someone else did it, uh, can you use a presentable value of the lease report? Um, Fantastic question. Absolutely brilliant question. So um, you've got clearing on land, <coughs> and the landholder doesn't give a right, doesn't claim a right to silence. They say someone else did it. Um, can you use a failure to file a police report or failure to report it to, say, NRM as um, part of your circumstantial case? My answer would be yes. Um, it's um, part of, you know, one of the threads that you can bring in, one of the strands of the cable that you build. You know, if the clearing occurred a year ago and the farmer didn't report it, um, then that really counts against them if their case ultimately is someone else did it without my consent. You know, the fact that they didn't report it and that say they're then using the land as well, that can pre certainly be brought in, I'd suggest. So can you, do you reckon you could say if, um, so there's a clearing, if there's a clearing, then as the, the landowner doesn't say a word, refuses to say anything, but you clearly know that he's aware that the clearing's on the land. Can that be used again? Well, if you have some police reports or evidence that he hasn't reported it, and the silence in itself. Yes, so you're in a Weisenstein sort of situation there. If someone is um, relying upon a right to silence, it, the, the prosecution has to have evidence that basically, in Weisenstein, it's, because there's a lot about the right to silence in the Weisenstein decision, and the, it's not that the person loses the right to silence, it's just that a jury or a judge in a summary proceeding is entitled to take into account the fact that there's no rebuttal by the defendant of the Crown's case and therefore the arbiter of fact is entitled to draw an inference that they can more readily accept the Crown's case because the defendant should have knowledge of what occurred and the fact that they don't give, want to give evidence, you can logically take that into account. You don't ignore the silence but the Crown still has to prove its case, but the circumstance of not the defendant not giving the evidence is something that can assist the Crown. And also if you get um, conflicting, they mightn't claim a full right to silence, but they claim something that, like in Baden Clay, he claimed that he wasn't involved and then he was um, basically um, stopped from raising 
Because what the Court of Appeal did was just say, well, they hadn't proved um, that he intended to kill her, that, sh that the jury wasn't entitled to find that, but he had, his lawyers had made a deliberate decision at trial that it was murder or nothing. So they didn't raise manslaughter and lack of intent, and that was never left to the jury, and he didn't give evidence on that basis. So the jury was entitled to take that into account. So, for instance, if he hasn't reported it, and now he, I'm saying he, let's make it a she, um, the farmer, she, is now saying that someone else did it, you can, you can see the inconsistencies in, in their story, and so you can use those things together. Circumstan what I really want to emphasise is circumstantial evidence is such a amorphous concept, and you really need to be aware of the principles and then apply it to whatever factual situation you're dealing with, and then think logically about normal human experience. You know, why do, do people do a large, you know, extent of clearing? It's for commercial benefit. You know they're running, but you don't do it for fun. You don't spend tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars just for the hell of it. Um, you think about the normal human experience and that all goes into building a circumstantial case. Any other questions? Right. Is, is there any reason to take post-offence conduct the any more compelling than pre-offence conduct? No. Such as the purchase of equipment, failed applications? Again, failed. a great question. Um, is post-offence conduct any more compelling than pre-offence conduct? No, it's not, um, and that, uh, that's what I was trying to emphasise. You know, you look at Plomp and Weisensteiner, pre and post offence conduct were always there. It's just that now it's given a label and sort of recognised as a subspecies of it, and that I think is helpful in itself. But in like in Plomp, that the they considered that he was having this affair before she drowned, and then also that what happened afterwards that he moved in with her and tried to marry her and you know that so you're looking at pre and post and it was all just part of circumstantial evidence so great question the answer is no there's no and it really depends on the facts and circumstances of each case and the weight that a, ju a jury or a judge in a summary offence wants to give to the different parts but if you think about that those strands of a cable building together that's a really good metaphor to think of Probably time for one more question, yeah. if anyone's got one. Otherwise, I'm conscious of the time, it's running two o'clock, so I'll hand back to Jenny. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Dr. McGrath. Look, um, I, I, I don't know about you, I, I don't have a legal background, but I actually found that very uh, insightful and, uh, <coughs> and very interesting. And we're, it's really great to see such a diverse group of people from our own department here, and also for other, you know, like Brisbane City Council and other departments to come and share this with us. So thank you for your insights and wise counsel, I call them. And um, so thank you, everyone. I mean, what we'll be doing, and I apologise for our uh, technical uh, mishap for, for both Chris and everyone here, but what we'll be doing is, Chris said, the, the uh, seminar's been recorded. Yeah, I've, my slides have been recorded. It's just we couldn't project them. Yeah, so, so we actually have those. So we'll be actually making all that available through the Alert website very shortly. Um, and if you are, not, are currently a member of Alert, you can actually register for that. So we've provided some information there. So if you're not sure, happy for you to contact us. So, um, so just really appreciate you taking the time to join us here today and um, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. And thanks again for Chris for joining us. I'm sure you're very used to